Welcome to Choice Classic Radio. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and help keep this show alive by donating at choiceclassicradio.com. For more of your favorite old-time radio shows, join us on our companion podcast, Choice Classic Radio, Mystery, Suspense, Dramas, and Horrors, where we bring to you the most mysterious tales that the golden age of radio had to offer. And now, with 314 episodes made, originally airing on the NBC network from 1949 to 1957, we bring to you Dragnet. <laughs> The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A potential killer is on the loose in your city. He's robbed six people. For no reason at all, he beats his victim senseless. He moves fast. He's well armed. Your job? Stop him. You'll be amazed when you compare Fatima with other long cigarettes. You'll find they now cost the same. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. You see, Fatima is the quality king-size cigarette. Because it contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild, with a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. So compare Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all long cigarettes. Start enjoying Fatima for a new year of greater smoking enjoyment. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment... Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, March 8th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the record bureau. It was 11.45 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Joe? Hi, Bill. Romero called about five minutes ago. He's on his way in from Georgia Street. Oh, thank you. Is the captain still around? He's gone for the night. You can catch him at home if you want to. Trouble? Uh, the rattlesnake bandit. Got two more couples tonight. All right. Bad? About the same as the last three jobs he pulled. Pretty vicious. Gave the victims a bad going over. Who are they? The young salesman, his girlfriend. They were parked up in the Silver Lake area. Bandit robbed him. When he didn't find enough money in the young fellow's wallet, he pistol whipped and messed him up quite a bit. Hmm. Why'd he do that? Oh, there's no reason for it. The young girl in the car had an engagement ring on. She offered to hand it over. The bandit pulled her out of the car, punched her in the face, hit her quite a few times. Guy just seems to be looking for blood, that's all. No leads on him, huh? No, not so far. It looks like I'm out. Have you got any aspirin, Bill? Yeah, I got a fresh bottle this afternoon. Lousy headache. I've had it all night. How about the thief's M.O.? The same, huh? Well, has been so far. He works the outlying districts, parking areas. Doesn't seem to be any reason at all for these sluggings. The victims all agree on that. No provocation at all. The guy just seems to get a kick out of punching in somebody's face. Hmm. Two pills in it? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Boys in robbery turn up anything? No, neither have we. Bandit operates in hot cars. He's got a few good prints to work with. No make, though. Guy works alone, huh? Well, he did for the first two jobs. Last few times, he had a bright-looking blonde with him. Good-looking, you know, nice figure. Mm -hmm. Victims say that she stands by and just seems to egg him on. I don't know. Seems to get a big thrill out of him, I guess. Hi, Bill. Bill? Hi. 
How'd you do, man? Doctor didn't think it'd be a good idea to bother him too much tonight. We can talk to him tomorrow. Well, how about the hold-up man's description? Did you get that? Yeah, from the girl. Matches what the other victims gave us. She didn't see the getaway car, though. Didn't have a chance. Well, how about the young fellow? Is he still unconscious? Yeah, they're going to move him to the county hospital. You should have seen his face. Yeah? Terrible. It's a mess. This bandit's girlfriend, the blonde, nothing at all on her? Victims say she's got a nice figure and good looking. Quite a few like that in Los Angeles. What are they getting out of these stick-ups anyway? Can't be too much, huh? Oh, that's just it. None of the heists have netted them more than fifty dollars. Hardly worth the trouble. Hot shot. I get it. What is it? Wait a minute. Rattlesnake bandit. He got another couple. Where? South end of Echo Park. Yeah. He shot both of them. Together with Cummings and McCready from Homicide, Ben and I drove to the scene of the holdup and shooting in the Echo Park area. The victims were identified as Ralph Younger, 34, a high school English teacher. He'd been beaten severely about the face and neck and shot once through the right shoulder. His companion was Athelma Donovan, 26, a grade school teacher. She'd been shot through the temple just above the eyes. She was still alive, but in a critical condition. We questioned Ralph Younger briefly before he was removed by ambulance to the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. His description of the hold-up man tallied exactly with that of the rattlesnake bandit. He also gave us the description and license number of the getaway car. We got out a broadcast and an APB. A routine check of the area failed to turn up any leads. 11 a.m. the next morning, Ralph Younger told us the story from his hospital bed. I was... I was teaching Thelma how to drive, Sergeant. We were going along that side street when the sedan pulled up forced us over to the curb. And your friend, Miss Donovan, was sitting in the driver's seat then? <sighs> That's right. I got out on my side and started over to ask this fellow what he was doing. Crowding us like that. He rushed up to me and started slugging me in the face with his gun. I went down. Mm -hmm. What did Miss Donovan do? <sighs> she started hollering for help. The hold-up guy ran over and shoved his gun at her. He had it pointed at her head. And he grabbed Thelma's purse and started looking through it. <laughs> For money, I guess. Uh -huh. Say, uh, would you mind moving this pillow over a little bit? Oh, sure, I got you. Oh. There we are. There, how's that, okay? Come on. Under the shoulder, please. All right. Yeah. There you are. That's fine. Thanks. Were you lying on the street while all this was going on, Mr. Younger? No, he yanked me to my feet, made me stand by the car with my hands up. Thelma was crying. The hold-up man looked through her purse, and then he said, Who are you trying to kid, lady? You got more money than this. Thelma told him the truth. <laughs> it was all she had, three dollars. So what happened then? He shoved the barrel of the gun against her head and... Right here, by the temple. Then I heard the gun go off. Thelma fell over in the seat. There wasn't any reason for it. No reason at all. Just shot her. Well, what did you do then? Do you remember? I jumped for the man. It's a... I wanted to kill him right there. He turned and fired the gun at me. Hit me right here. Below the shoulder. Mm -hmm. Then he ran out and got in his car and drove off. It was a blonde girl with him. I got a good look at her. Blonde, pretty, attractive. Mm -hmm. Well, is there anything else about the man's description that you might have forgotten to tell us last night? No, I don't think so. I gave you the license number of his car. Can't you find him that way? It was a stolen car, Mr. Young. We took it from one of his other victims. It was found out in Wiltshire this morning. Abandoned. I only wish I'd got my hands on him. Poor Thelma. How is she, you know? Well, there's no late report. Maybe you better check with the doctor, huh? Yeah. Hey, before you go, would you mind ringing this button here? It's for the nurse. The shoulder's giving me trouble again. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, thanks very much, Younger. Sure hope that shoulder of yours gets better. I hope so. Goodbye. We'll be checking with you later on. Uh, yeah, okay. Come on, then. Romero? Joe? How'd you do, Bill? Checked with the doctor. Donovan girl's still unconscious. Pretty critical. Uh -huh. What'd the doc say? Is she gonna pull through? She might. They can't tell yet. One thing's sure, though. What's that? Bullet did a lot of damage. Yeah. 
She's totally blind. Four days before a bullet from the hold-up gun had blinded schoolteacher Thelma Donovan for life, the rattlesnake bandit and his blonde girlfriend were unknown to the city of Los Angeles. In the space of little more than 96 hours, they'd robbed and slugged a dozen people from one end of the city to the other. In every case, the attacks were just about as brutal and vicious as they were unprovoked. The amount of money taken from each victim was negligible. The only apparent conclusion was that the bandit and his girlfriend were out for blood. That night, despite a citywide alert to all radio cars and patrolmen, the suspects robbed and slugged two more couples between the hours of 10 p.m. and midnight. Between midnight and 1.30 a.m., they got two more victims. 2.30 a.m., Ben and I got back to the city hall, the carpool. Well, it looks like a place over there, huh? Mm-hmm. I wonder how McCready and Cummings made out. I hope they got more than we have. Yeah. Yeah, this is good right here. Right, Want to get the radio, Joe? Yeah, fine. Let's go. Uh-huh. Doggone it. I knew I forgot something. What's that? Cigarettes. You got any left? I don't think so. Old pack is all... No, there's one left in here. No, yeah. no, it's all right. I can't take your last smoke. Well, go ahead. There's a machine upstairs by the elevator. I'll get some. Oh, all right. Sure, better get these shoes half so I'll be walking around in my stocking feet pretty soon. Well, you just got them a couple of weeks ago, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Tops are as good as new. Sold to the darn things went just like that. No wonder they had them on sale. Yeah. In just a minute, I want to get those smokes. Oh, yeah. Skipper say he was going to stay around? Until about two, yeah. He's probably gone by now. Yeah, it's a long day. Anything in the book? Just a minute. Yeah, your wife called. I want you to get a refill on that prescription for your little boy. Oh, uh-huh. Hiya. How'd you two do? Nothing. How about you? Chandler called from robbery a minute ago. Thinks they may have something. Yeah? The 211, big service station out on Pico. Hold-up man had a blonde in the car with him. What about descriptions? Chibes pretty well with the guy we're after. Well, the M.O. doesn't. That thief and his girl haven't tried anything but car hold-up since they started. How'd they manage the job? Well, you know how they've been operating for transportation. They rob the people, steal their car. When they reach another victim, they transfer to his car. First time they switched that system was tonight. The hold up on South Hoover, the man and his wife. Huh? Instead of changing over, they stayed in the blue Chevy Coupe. The same one they took in the job before that. Up to now, they've used the same hot car in the last three jobs. Sure gonna help if they stick with it. What about the gas station in Dunham? Well, it, excuse me, Crowley Chandler. Homicide Cummings. Yagline. Uh-huh. Five four three eight nine. Right, thanks. They dug up a witness to the gas station job. Suspects drove off in a blue Chevy coupe. License five Paul three eight nine. Same car. Huh? That stops me. What was it take? Twenty three bucks. Slugged the attendant. Took off. The broadcast's out. Area's been alerted. Nothing yet. Okay, Ben. Yep. Sure is growing into a long night. Yeah, you're gonna cover, huh, Bill? Yeah, until Fergie gets back. Right. Well, we'll be checking with you. Guy. Uh-huh. Homicide Romero. Yeah. How's that? Yeah, right, thanks. Drugstore in South Fig, 211, slugging. Blonde girl drove the escape car. Yeah. Five Paul, 389. In the next three hours before dawn, the rattlesnake bandit and his blonde girlfriend held up and robbed a restaurant and two more service stations and made good their escape. For some unknown reason, they continued to use the same stolen car, the blue Chevrolet Coupe. By noontime the following day, composite pictures of the hold-up couple were drawn up by the crime lab artist from the descriptions given by the victims. The pictures were printed up and given wide distribution throughout the city. The description and license number of the escape car was in the hands of every radio car and patrolman in all divisions. The search was intensified. It got us nothing. 
The following night and early morning, without even slowing their pace, the suspects added four more holdups and sluggings to their credit. One of the victims was Fred Lerner, proprietor of a small lunch counter near 18th and Olive. I've been held up before, officer, half a dozen times. Never saw a punk as hard-looking as this guy, though. You're sure about the description, Mr. Lerner? Well, he stood just as close as you're standing to me now. Wild look in his eye, waving that gun around. I wasn't taking any chances. I gave him everything. How much was that? Eighteen dollars and a half. Well, how about the getaway car? You're pretty sure of the make and the color? Well, I ran to the door there as soon as they left. Saw him drive off. There's a license just as I wrote it down. It's uh, 5P389. Uh, five I saw the whole thing. Sure surprised Lois would tie up with a punk like him. Lois? Who's that? Well, you know, the blonde who drives the car for him, Lois Hagen. Well, how do you know that's her name? She used to be a waitress, worked for my brother. Lois Hagen, blonde. I spotted her right away in that car. Yeah? Yeah, sure, Lois. Didn't you know it was her? 7.30 a.m. We put in a call to the record bureau and had them check on the name and description of Lois Hagen. No make, no previous record. With the help of Fred Lerner and his brother, we traced the Hagen girl to a drive-in where she used to work. There, we checked the employment records and got an address on her. 1800 Norwich Drive. Turned out to be a small apartment house in West Hollywood. Ben checked with the landlady while I waited in the car. Campus 19. Campus 19. Well, that's it. What'd you get? Talked to the landlady. She's managed the apartment for 16 years. Yeah? She never heard of Lois Hagen. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. And now, here's an authentic report from Fatima Cigarettes. 1949. Fatima more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. 1950. Another record-breaking year, with more long cigarette smokers insisting on Fatima quality than ever before. In 1951, enjoy Fatima quality yourself. Yes, friends, in Fatima... The difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos, the finest Turkish and domestic varieties, extra mild and superbly blended, to give you a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Quality of manufacture, smooth, plump cigarettes rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Quality, even to the appearance of the bright, clean, golden yellow package, carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, Fresh, extra mild flavor. Compare Fatima yourself. Fatimas now cost the same as other long cigarettes, but your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Start enjoying Fatima for a new year of greater smoking enjoyment. Insist on Fatima, the quality king-size cigarette. Best of all, long cigarettes. <laughs> Tuesday, March 13th. That night and the one following, the rattlesnake bandit and his blonde girlfriend, supposedly Lois Hagen, continued their campaign of holdups and sluggings. They robbed two liquor stores, an all-night cafe, a cigar shop, and two more service stations. In each case, the descriptions of the suspects and their getaway car was the same. Routine investigations got nowhere. Ben and I went to work checking out the thin lead that we had on the girl known as Lois Hagen. After three days of pounding the pavement and asking questions, we found two former waitresses at drive-in restaurants who had worked with Lois Hagen. Both of them gave us addresses where they thought the Hagen girl had lived at one time. One of them was a phony. It was a vacant lot. The other panned out. It was a rooming house out in the Boyle Heights district. The manager told us that the Hagen girl lived there two years before. She told us that as far as she knew, the girl's mother, a Mrs. Ernestine Hagen, still ran a small French laundry on South Hobart Boulevard. We found Mrs. Hagen working in her shop. She was a small, thin woman with gray hair. Yes, I have a daughter, Lois. What's the matter? I'd like to talk to her, Mrs. Hagen. Do you know where we can locate her? Probably sounds funny to you. I haven't seen my daughter in two years. Well, do you have any idea where she's living, ma'am? No, she's not much of a daughter. We didn't get along. As I say, two years ago, we had an argument. She left me. Never wrote a letter. I just don't know. I see. I heard she was living in Detroit for a while. I guess she's back here now. 
One of my lady friends, Mrs. McCormick, saw Lois shopping out in Hollywood. That was about a month ago. Mm -hmm. How old is your daughter, Mrs. Hayes? She'll be 20 next month. She looks older than she really is. Won't you excuse me, please? My flat iron back here. I have it heating. Certainly, ma'am. Do you have a copy of the composite picture of the girl? Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's right here. Okay. I didn't realize it was getting so late. I have this rush order to get ready by 4 o'clock, officers. If you want, you can come back here. We can talk while I get it out. All right, ma'am. Thank you. Come on. There's a chair there, if you like. Oh, thank you. Seems I'm always so busy lately. I used to have some fine help. It's not so easy to find anymore. This iron seems awful hot. I wonder if you'd mind looking at this picture, ma'am, this one here. Yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. Looks something like Lois. You're looking for her, is that it? she done something again? Well, we're not sure, ma'am. Has she been in trouble before? I can't be more ashamed of her than I already am. Yeah, she's been in trouble before. She was nothing but trouble. My only child. Her father died when she was a baby, but I guess she needed a father. I couldn't do anything with her. Was your daughter ever in any serious trouble with the police, I mean? I don't know, maybe. She was. I didn't hear about it. I tried to understand it. We never got along. I don't know. This makes me sick to think about it. Well, how about her friends, Mrs. Hagen? I mean, her recent friends. Do you happen to know any of them? No. Lois never brought him home. I knew they were tramps. I heard the way the neighbors were talking. Trampy fellas, trampy girls, drinking, doing things. You know, she didn't learn those things at home. What was Lois' last known address? Do you have any idea at all? Place in Boyle Heights, the boarding house. It's the last I heard of Lois. She never wrote a letter. That's another thing. Yes, ma'am? She could have had the best education any girl could want. I worked 12 years in the laundry here to give it to her. I sent it to the convent. Even the nuns couldn't do anything with her. She only sassed them back. She finally quit altogether. I don't know. Can you think of anybody who might know where your daughter is? Maybe one of your relatives? Yeah, we don't have any relatives here. I have a brother in Ohio. That's all. These lace blouses are an awful lot of trouble. Would you pull out that plug, Sergeant, please? Oh, mm, yes, ma'am. I wonder if you uh, have a picture of your daughter that we could borrow. We'll see that it's returned to you. Yeah, right. I got lots of pictures of Lois. She's a pretty girl, you know. Looks quite a bit like me when I was young. Yes, ma'am. Well, thanks very much for your time. Even the nurses at the hospital said it when Lois was born. Beautiful child. Certainly strange, isn't it? How's that? When they're babies. They all look so clean and so good. Yes, ma'am. What happens to him? Before we left Mrs. Hagen, we got a photograph of her daughter, Lois, and then we drove back to the office. We spent the rest of the afternoon showing the picture to several of the robbery victims. All of them identified the Hagen girl as the bandit's accomplice. We got out a supplementary broadcast. That night, the hold-up couple failed to put in an appearance. The following night, the same. Not a sign of them. Still no sign of the escape car, either. Where they might be hiding out, we had no idea. The search went on. Repeated checks through the stats office and the record bureau failed to turn up any new leads. We stayed on it. Four nights later, the still unidentified holdup man and Lois Hagen started in all over again. Two drugstore holdups, two robberies of couples and parked cars. All of the victims were beaten senseless. Monday, March 19th, 8 a.m. Joe? Hi. Did they turn up anything last night? Two more jobs. Both victims identified the Hagen girl as the accomplice. Anything else? Still using the same escape car. That's about it. Yeah. Well, we're no closer than we were a week ago, huh? I checked the hospital on the druggist they slug. How's he doing? I don't know yet. Still unconscious. I get it. Homicide, Friday. Yeah, Mike. Where? Yeah, right away. What have you got? 32R. They're out on 18th and Hill. Yeah? The hold-up car. They just spotted it. 8.20 a.m., 
Together with Cummings and McCready, we drove out to 18th and Hill, where the officers in Unit 32R had the holdup car staked out. It was parked in the back of a large service station on Hill Street near the corner of 18th. We talked with the manager, and he told us that a blonde girl answering Lois Hagen's description had left the car there earlier that morning just to have the distributor fixed and the battery recharged. She told him that she'd call for the car early that night. Because of the way that the service station was situated, it would have been impossible to stake out on the blue coupe without making it look obvious. We explained the setup to the manager and made arrangements for Ben and I to pose as employees. That way we could keep a close watch on the car until the suspects called for it. Cummings and McCready holed up in a coffee shop directly across the street. Two teams of men from robbery covered from their vantage points. Ben and I took up our posts as supervisors of the station's ten-minute car wash. They sure do a great business here, huh? Yeah. You mentioned to the manager about keeping the area clear around that car, didn't you? Yeah, it's all set up. We're not going to have an excuse in the world if we miss those two. Yeah, if they show up. What are we supposed to do now? Pull these tickets off the cars as they move off the wash line? Yeah, that's all. Just uh, slip the tickets in that box over there, see? Mm-hmm. Must have run them a few dollars, huh, installing all this equipment. Seems to be paying off, doesn't it? What time you got now? A uh, few minutes past four. Want to smoke? No, I just put one out. 1 a.m. Ben spotted a young blonde girl turn the corner onto Hill and start up the street toward the service station. As she came closer, she looked to the right and the left. She paused in front of the station, looked on both sides of the street, and then she turned completely around and walked on past. It's Lois Hagen. She's going right down to the corner. How about it? Yeah, I'll put in with you. How about a tail? We can't just let her walk away from us. No, just a minute. Take a look. She's turning around. Coming back this way. She's coming in. Yeah, we better get back to our car. Looks like it. Come on. Right. The young blonde entered the garage office, paid the repair bill, and drove off in the holdup car. Ben and I followed an 80K. Cummings and McCready tailed us. The blue coupe moved two blocks down Hill Street and then turned into an apartment garage. We parked on the street, went in and got the manager out of bed. We showed him Lois Hagen's picture. He told us that she was registered alone in apartment 16. He failed to recognize the description of the holdup man. McCready and three men from robbery covered the front and back exits. Cummings, Ben, and I climbed the stairs to the third floor. Number 16. Joe, you want to ring it? Yeah? Sorry, ma'am. <laughs> Bedroom, Bill. Right, I'll take the kitchen. Wait a minute, what is this? Police officers, you, Lois Hagen. You get out of here, let me out. Bedroom's empty. Nothing back here. All right, where is he? Come on, let's have it. Frank, get out! Upstairs, Joe. Watch her, Bill. I got it. Come on, Bill. Yep. Upstairs, Joe. Watching? Yeah. Hold it. Yep. Back it up. The car. Come on down, coppers. Give me room. Give it up, mister. You haven't got a chance. Give me room. I'm coming down. We got the building covered, mister. Give it up. Look out, Joe. I'll get his gun. How is he? Dead. Joe, Ben, you all right? Yeah, Bill. You want to take the girl downstairs? Let me see, please. Frank? Frank? All right, lady. It didn't have to happen. I tried to tell him, get away. He wouldn't listen. Never listen. Let's go. We were married yesterday. You didn't know that, did you? Just married. Yeah. Married two days. Yeah, well, the honeymoon's over. Come on, lady. <laughs> On August 5th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here's our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Here's an invitation we just received from New York's famous Stork Club. Host Sherman Billingsley asked us to pass it on to you Dragnet listeners who have television sets. It reads, Fatima, best of all long cigarettes, cordially invites you to see the Stork Club on television beginning this week. Well, Dragnet welcomes the Stork Club to the Fatima family. It's a fine television show. You know the Stork Club recommends only the best. And as Sherman Billingsley says, in long cigarettes, that means extra mild Fatima. You can judge that yourself, just as I have, by comparing Fatima 
with other long cigarettes. Buy a pack of Fatimas. You'll find they now cost the same, but in Fatima, the difference is quality. The body of the dead hold-up man was identified as that of Frank Ralston Kilbride. His accomplice, Lois Hagen, was tried and convicted on six counts of armed robbery and assault with a deadly weapon. She received sentences as prescribed by law and is now serving her term in the state penitentiary for women. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker. Fatima Cigarettes has brought you Dragnet portions transcribed from Los Angeles. We the People is next on NBC. That concludes today's episode. We'd like to thank you and remind you to donate at choiceclassicradio.com. Remember, your donations make episodes like this possible.